The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. It is an honor, as always, to bring the precious Word to all of us this morning. Um, Somebody said you must be abiding all week long. Truthfully, I've been agonizing all week long. There are certain passages and and certain texts that you can't, they're so grand and so deep, you're better off not touch, but to internalize. And so with that, I I come um, so humbled by the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ. Both my wife and I miss this body. We've been gone for six weeks. We made it to the Middle East, to Lebanon, and got to see the school, the refugee school that had been started there for the last four years. What started with 60 kids is now 250 kids, and with 290 signed up, spent some time also in Europe with Rodney, and he sends his love and gratitude to you guys and said, please, please keep praying for him. As he gets older and older, age is hitting him, and he said, I can't run as hard, so pre- please pray for endurance and, uh, and much, much perseverance, and there's a lot of work that God is bringing into their life. And a couple of days ago, out of Mexico, I was on the phone with Nick Deckard and, and Jackie. As you know, some of you, he, they've taken off for a month to be there and to see and if this is where God called them. And so they, 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 they got to the orphanage and they landed running. He said, we're living, the, the two of them and the two boys with them, they're living out of a 15 by 15 foot room. He said, they... It has been 12-hour days for them, just going, going, going. He said, also pray for perseverance and endurance and strength for them also. And, and as even to learn the language. So much, much to be prayed about and prayed for. So with that, I want to I introduce the topic for us. I am the true vine, is what Jesus said. For the last seven weeks, we've been looking and going through the I am statements or declarations, if you will. These are self-declaration coupled with what we would call picture metaphors. They have a deep Christological richness and meaning about them pertaining to the deity and even to the divinity of Jesus Christ. In these I Am statements, there are no greater name or declaration to declare the Godhood of God than the Ego I am, the I Am that Jesus Christ declared and claimed for Himself, as, as has the Father. Coupled, coupled with earthly metaphors, Link them together. It relates the hearer to the, to the all-sufficient, all-good God in a very tangible parable of everyday life that the disciples would have gotten and hopefully we have been getting. They explain the self-existing I Am who is sovereign and supreme and who is our source and sustenance in everyday life. And not only that, our full, our full sufficiency. And what I appreciated about the last seven weeks of these men who served us well, who preached, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. And last week with Brother Rick, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They didn't just defend or debate the deity of Jesus Christ. They helped us. They helped us see that the life 
of sufficiency is in this great I am, that the great union of the I am with his people is real and it's tangible. And what they helped us do is is adore and internalize and drink deep of God. So this morning, we want to conclude this series come to it, comes to its climax, to this final I am of the Lord. And so what I want to do is read for us. If you have your Bibles, please take your Bibles and turn with me to John 15. John chapter 15 to this final I am statement. John chapter 15 verses 1 through 11 starts with this. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Oh, my father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things, these things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Would you, would you pray with me this morning? Father, um, the goodness of your grace mediated to us by and through the vine, the I am, the Christ. Father, may his words right now stop becoming ink on paper, but become realities. Life, bread, food, water, feeding and refreshing our soul. And only by and through your Holy One, your Holy Spirit, will this land so deep and so glorious on our hearts. So would you please, by your Spirit, Lord, come, come and bring your word that we may have a life and have it abundantly in the vine. In Christ's name we do pray. By his name, by his authority, and by his will. Amen. If you were to compress these 11 verses, this passage, you would want to ask questions. The who's who of these of this passage and and Christ comes right out and says I am the true vine this is center and this is central in this passage not only is he the great I am I am the vine 
but he also introduces the gardener to us, and then he introduces the branches who we are. And then backing our way into this passage, if you will, I want to ask another question, an important one, because the theme of fruit is all over this passage, six times over. So we want to ask the question, what is fruit that glorifies God the Father, that would glorify the gardener? And followed by the obvious question, how do we bear fruit? How do we bear fruit? What is our role in fruit bearing? And so let me set the context for us in John 15. It's Thursday night. It's hours before Christ being delivered over to be, to be tried and to be crucified. We find ourselves at the center and in the heart of what has been called the upper room discourse. What began in chapter 13 and ends in the high priestly prayer in chapter 17. Christ's last word, if you will. It's his last testament to the disciples. As Rick mentioned last week, they're questioning, they're confused, they're worried. The disciples are. And he leaves them with this. And behind the scene, Judas has been dismissed and he's on the move to betray Christ. Satan is plotting. The Pharisaic conspiracy is boiling over. The temple guards are being armed for the arrest. The cross is ready and the tomb is waiting. When he, what he is about to say to them, they're hanging on every single word right here in John 15. Their trials, their testings, their tribulations in life are unexpected. And they have no idea what's going to happen to them. The progression in the Gospel of John is very evident. Chapter 1, the command and the call comes, follow me. In chapter 14, opens up with the theme, believe in God, believe also in me. And thus, Christ lays out the promises. Chapter 15 is abide in me. As he invites them. Stripped down. Stripped down to its very core. Its very nature. Its very essence. Abiding in Christ. Is the cap. And the foundation. Of the Christian life. If you've noticed here. In these 11 verses. There's no mention of sin. There's no mention of Satan. There's no mention of temptation. There's no mention of spiritual warfare. There's no mention of Christian service. No ministerial office. No deacons. No elders. No family life. No the, none of the role of the father or the mother or children. No Bible study. No worship service. No music. No discipleship. No mission conferences. No evangelism. All those things are important. But stripped to its core, what's mentioned here is abide. Abide in me. Is the very life, is the le very life of God in the soul of man. And so I'll call this for us, life on the vine. Life on the vine. Follow with me for a second here. Chapter 14, verse 31, ends with this statement. Get up, let us go from here. And as they got up and they made their way with the solitude of the upper room behind them and the agony of Gethsemane is ahead of them. They're on a walk through the Kidron Valley by the temple and up into the Garden of Gethsemane. Somewhere along the way, Christ makes this declaration to them. I am the true vine. Many commentators have suggested 
They were walking by the temple gate, and there hung bigger than life, a massive size, a golden vine ornament. The imagery and the symbolism of the vine goes way back, goes way back into the Old Testament as Israel being God's own vine. Every disciple and every Jew would have been familiar with this imagery. It was the preeminent symbolism of the nation of Israel. It would have been their stars and stripes for Israel as being God's own choice and in God's own vineyard. And as Brian Rutland read for us, passages like Isaiah 5 and Jeremiah 2 and Ezekiel 15 and Hosea 10 and, and Psalm 80, they describe in God's own word, this vine has become faithless vine, degenerate, fruitless, sour grapes or sour fruit. So when Jesus walks by this temple door and sees the vine and says, I am the true vine. Israel is a failed shadow. Israel was supposed to be the shadow and the type, and they failed. This was the reality. This was the true one. It's no longer a nation, but God's own beloved son, who will be the true vine of God. What he's telling his disciples in, his, in this statement is their attachment and their identity is no longer to a nation, but to God, the true vine of God. Humanly speaking, Jesus had been everything to his disciples. Their provider, he had been their teacher, they had been their counselor, he had been their guardian, he had been their protector. He'd been their shepherd. He'd been the leader. But now, this is a game changer, if you will. He is the I am to them and to us. So the last words before the cross, he leaves them. Ego, I am, me. I am the true vine. And what they would have understood is this close union Vines grow almost on every household in Israel. They would have understood this union, this closeness of what Christ is describing to them. He could have said, I am the king and you're my people. He could have said, I'm your master and you're my servants. He could have said, I'm your teacher and you're my students. All those relationships would have required an outward moral conformity. But when he says, I am the vine, the power lies from the vine and from the within to come into the lives inwardly to these people, to give us life and to give them life. Not just restrain behavior, but changed hearts. To give strength, power to those weak, feeble hearts. And when he says, I am the vine, he's saying, I am all supreme. He is everything, everything. He is the source of life. He is all sufficient, sustaining all the branches that abide in him. He's not saying, I'm a better vine or I am some upgraded vine. Vine, he's saying, I am the only vine. I am the one. I am the one. And so, I love the words of Henry Skugel, who says, it's the life of God in the soul of man. I want you to hang on to that statement throughout this whole topic here. I, it's the life of God in the soul of man. It's God's own vine, not fallen people, not a nation, but God who is well pleased in his son. And by the way, as a reminder in verse 5, he says again, I am the vine and you are the branches. Such emphatic statement is to remind them, you're not the vine. 
You're not divine. Your full dependency, your full reliance is on me being the vine. And so the farming idea, garden, requires a gardener. And so he introduces us and we're introduced to a gardener. And he says, and my father is the gardener. If you will, the vine dresser, the husbandman. A farmer, a gardener, a cultivator, someone who cares and guards and protects and cleans the garden and the plants. His job is to bring maximum flowers and fruit out of the vine. That's his job. Verse 2, and every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes so that it bears much fruit. Calvin says, believers are under the watchfulness and care of the Father. His faithfulness as a gardener is constantly over us. Cleaning, pruning, washing, because evil desires and the flesh remains in us. Sometimes to lift a dangling branch, sometimes to bring a branch closer to Christ. He does the work of a gardener. Spurgeon says this. He says, Brothers and sisters, if if we were more willing to feel the edge of the word and to let it cut away even, even something that may be very dear to us, we should not need so much pruning by affliction. It is because the first knife does not always produce the desired result that another sharp tool is used by which we are effectually pruned and cleaned and trimmed. Here's the reality of the gardener. As hard as it seems to be pruned, for certain things to be pruned in our life, the hand of the great gardener is never so close as when he is clipping and cutting. It's never so close. They are so ever careful and they are so ever loving in our lives. And here's what he's saying. This seems so contradictory to American Christianity. He's saying the more fruit, the most fruitful branches get the knife. The most fruitful branches get the knife. And the imagery is so beautiful. You have the father, the gardener on the outside, cleaning and trimming through his providence. And you have the vine on the inside, feeding and growing the branches. Supplying us internally. Brings me to one more thing about the Father. Verse 8. Look at verse 8. He says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so and so prove to be my disciples. So two things really quick I want to pull out of this. Number one, the fruitful life, which I have not defined yet, is the proof of true discipleship. It's not so much trying to prove life as much as it is showing life. We'll talk about this in a minute. So fruit is important. It's not to be just this sporadic, meager, fruitful life, but bear much fruit. Second thing, the part of this verse is my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. Whatever your definition or our definition of fruit is, I want to up the game for us for a minute. And I want to declare this, that if your God and our God is glorious, if He is glorious, then when He plants... He plants gloriously.
So what's our definition of fruit? What's our definition of fruit? What does fruit look like in the Christian life? It's the first important question that we want to ask this text. The theme of fruit is all over this passage. The word karpos appears six times here in our text, 60 to- 66 times in the New Testament. And as you read this passage, it seems to grow with fruits as Christ is speaking. It seems to escalate and progress. There is this progression. It seems to swell and increase and grow. Look with me. Verse 2, bear fruit. And again, verse 2, and then bear more fruit. And verse 5, much fruit. And verse 8, much fruit. And then verse 16, that your, that your, that your fruit would remain, would remain. The term bearing, bearing is mentioned eight times in this chapter. And, what it, and in the present tense, it indicates a, a, su, a sustained productivity of this fruit in your life or in my life. So who's going to pull that off? God is glorious. And when God plants, He plants gloriously. So I hope your fruit, whatever the definition is, is glorious. Is glorious. I know some have suggested, what is this fruit? Is it a committed life? Is it a faithful life? Is it a devoted life? Maybe it's a disciplined life. An ever-serving life. A sold-out life for Christ. All the stuff that we do, is that fruit? Is that what he's talking about here in this passage? I know most of us, I know I am wired that way. I want, I want to do great things for the kingdom of God. I want to be sold out. I want to, I want to find my meaning and calling in life and go after it and go after it well. I know most of us live in that lifestyle, live in that mentality. Andrew Murray says, do not confound work and fruit. There may be a good deal of work for Christ that is not the fruit of the heavenly vine. Some confuse large green leaves to fruits. Lots of work, big show, lots of greenery. Look, Life is big in this household. No. The fruit, let me propose for us, the fruit that Christ is talking about is always the life of the vine. Let me bring this out. The nature of the fruit will always reflect the nature of the vine. Grapevine will produce grapes, Apple trees will produce apples. It is the life of the vine that is pressed in and through and out of us. It is the life of Christ. It's not what we do. It's what He does in us. Galatians 5.22, you know the passage. The fruit... Not the fruits, but the fruit, the one spirit, is the love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. One man said it is a nine-part configuration of the person and the beauty of Christ that the Spirit of God produces in us and through us. It's not the stuff that we do. John 16, 14, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he says, He will glorify me, for He will take off mine and will disclose it to you. Another mind-boggling passage. I've scratched my head over this one. 
John 17 in the high priestly prayer 22. Listen to this language. The glory which you have given me, I have given them. The glory which you have given me, I have given them. We're not talking about the Shekinah glory of God or Christ here. What we're talking about is the very manifestation of God's character and person mediated in us and through us as we're abiding in the vine. And that's why, that's why you can go back to that verse, prove to be my disciples. The proof of discipleship is not what we do and what we're doing and how busy our life is. It's not the size of our ministry or service or what we sacrifice or do. The proof of discipleship is the presence of Christ in our life. Skugel puts it this way, I'd rather see the real impression of God-like nature upon my own soul than have a vision from heaven or an angel sent to tell me that my name were enrolled in the book of life. The real, the real impression of God-like in us. Keeping with the analogy of fruit, something about fruit. I don't know if you do this. I go to, to the market sometimes and I take the fruit and I smell it. There is a smell about it. There is, you bite into it. There is flavor. There is texture. There is color. There are, there are juices in the fruit. That's the life of the vine in us. That's the very impressions of God in our life. It's not the stuff we do. It's not the stuff we do. That's why Paul could say, for me to live is Christ, because the sap of my life is Christ. That's why he could say that. Second thing, bearing fruit, what we're called to do, is not the same as producing fruit. It's the vine's job. It's the vine's produces the fruit. The branches merely carry them. We carry them. We don't produce the stuff. You don't get up in the morning and go, be holy, be holy, be holy, be holy. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to be loving. I'm it's the life of Christ. We carry. We carry the fruit. The branches are simply our conduit through which flows the fruit producing juices of the vine through us. And while, three, while they are rejoiced over, and while they're the encouragement and the refreshment to the saints, the most fruitful branches are the ones that are bowed down, humble and meek. There isn't the rah-rah about their life. They're the most lowliest type of branches. Those are the most that carry. One man put it so well. He says, quote, The Christian life could be explained only in terms of Jesus Christ. And if your life as a Christian can be still be explained in terms of your personality, your willpower, your gifts, your talents, your money, your courage, your scholarship, your dedication, your sacrifice, or your anything, then you have the Christian life. You are not yet living it. It's the life of Christ. It's the life of God. Remember verse 8? My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. The security of discipleship. If you struggle with eternal security, your answer is not double down, get more committed, get more involved. 
Your answer is Christ. So the question, the question is, I forgot one thing. We were never commanded to bear fruit. We were never commanded to produce fruit. Just to sit and bear the life of Christ. So, what is our part? What do we do? Remain, abide, and stay. Remain, abide, and stay. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of its self unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. It is the abiding life. It's living on the vine. You see the phrase abide in me? It's used it's used like 118 times in the New Testament. It's, it's a huge theme. 67 times. It's, it's one of John's favorite phrases. The word mino is to stay, to remain, to continue, to dwell. Ten times here in 11 verses. Coupled with the prepositional phrase, in me or I in you, mentioned 14 times. It speaks of this mystical, what the Puritans would call the mystical union or, 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 or mutual dwelling of one another. Earlier in 1423, he says, My father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And here in 15.4, he's calling us and he's inviting us. He says, come and abide. Come and abide. Come and abide. There is no deity. There is no God that will ever attach himself to filthy, fallen sinners like us. There is no deity out there. Heard an illustration a while back. He says, when you pull up to a gas station and ask someone for direction, they most likely will give you direction and instruction about the way. That's where most religions are at. Outward conformity, outward restraint, and outward behavior. He says, Christ says, I must get in myself. I will take you there myself I won't just give you instructions and directions. I will personally enter and go in with you. I will see you there personally. That's what sets Christianity so different than anything else. It is this abide in me. This command is in the emphatic position. It's the primary responsibility of the branches and of us. It is our responsibility. So the question is, what is this abiding in Christ? Here's number one. It is the spiritual posture of your heart. It is the spiritual posture of your heart. Every heart is spiritual. Every heart is attached to something and to someone. Listen, lean on your own arm and wisdom and you will abide in fear and worry and anxiety lean on your own self-interest and you will find the sap of bitterness anger and f- come to fruition andrew murray says abiding in christ is nothing but the giving up of oneself to be ruled and taught and led So resting in the arm of the everlasting love. It is one faith. It's the faith and the trust of relying on Christ. It's resting. Some of you remember Isaiah 30, 15. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said in repentance or in returning. And in rest you will be saved in quietness and in trust is your strength. 
not in the anxious anxiety of your heart. One of the true marks of spiritual maturity is to, is to be able to sense where my heart is going and going, stop. I must be still and I must be quiet. I must go to the, bre- to the, br- to the vine. I must go to the vine. So, spiritual posturing of the heart. Piper says, I think the essential meaning of our act of abiding is the act of receiving and trusting all that God is for us. I've said this before. (laughs) Man Man can't live. Man shall not live on blogs and text messages, but on the abiding love of Jesus Christ. When you receive the news your lungs are riddled with cancer. When a relationship is hard in a marriage, when a son or a daughter take their lives, where will you go? Where will you go? To people? A soul filled with the large thoughts of the vine will be strong branch with a strong branch and will abide confidently. So spiritual posture is everything about abiding. Second, spiritual proximity. Spiritual proximity. The solitude of your heart. What is nearest and dearest to your heart. Many evangelicals, American Christians fragmentize and marginalize their life, their Christian life. It's either half hour in the morning or two hours on Sunday morning. God is calling us to abide in Him, to walk with Him, to drink with Him, to eat of Him, to suck the sap of life from Him. So many Christians complain of their own barrenness, spiritual dryness. I love this. Psalm 92 says this, The righteous man will flourish or sprout like a palm tree. He will grow like the cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still yield fruit at old age. Thank God for that verse. They shall be full of sap and very, very, very green. Very green. Don't you want to be that? Abide. Abide. Morgan Campbell says to abide in him then is to be, have a sustained conscious communion with him. It's to draw the fullness of Christ. It's to draw the fullness of Christ. Here's one thing. Christ said it and I have, I have to say it. Here's the warning in this passage. He says, Unless, if a branch can, cannot bear fruit of itself, and unless you abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The word cannot is so emphatic and it's double negative. It doesn't mean you, you bear less or you bear fewer less. You can't do anything. And he's not talking to immoral people. He's not talking to liars and murderers or thieves. He's talking to people who have their lives all cleaned up. To anybody, a moral person, a religious person, an educator, a business owner, a nurse, a doctor, a parent, you can't bear fruit. And if anyone does not abide in me, He is thrown away. Do you see what he's saying? If I can't have all of you and you can't have all of me abounding and abiding in one another, we have nothing to do with another, with one another. All of you for all of me. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. All of you for all of me. This is way grander and way deeper than I made Jesus the Lord of my life 25, 30 years ago. This is a sustained living relationship of Jesus Christ. 
I am out of time. I have five pages left, so. <laughs> so how does this happen? Two things. Here's our, here's our position. Jesus told the disciples in verse 3, You are already clean. Your identity is right there. I don't have to busy run around trying to prove I'm a Christian. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. This is not some sort of progressive assessment of Christ to the disciples, but a positional declaration. It is impossible for us to abide in Jesus Christ unless God declares us holy, holy, clean. Washed by the blood of Christ and declared by the word of Christ. So, three things, three things. It is evident in our text, verses 7, verses 9, and verses 11. Where is the place? What are the means of abiding in Christ and Christ in us? This, this mutual union, this mutual indwelling. Number one, his word. Number two, his love. And number three, his joy. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Psalm 138, 2 says this, For you have magnified and elevated your word according together with all your names. God loves his word. And he says, make my word, make your heart home for my word. Again, this isn't just a 10 minute or 20 minute in the morning. This is a deep meditation. He's saying, I am, let my word tabernacle. Let my word make its home in your heart. My prayer every morning is, Lord, as I read your word, would you show me yourself in your word? Draw out Christ. Draw out Christ. To read with the eyes of faith. Story is told of the great missionary Hudson Taylor. Taylor struggled to get more of Christ in his life. He prayed, he agonized, he fasted, made resolutions, read the Bible. But the sense of holiness and serenity and vitality and power that he sought eluded him. One day he received a letter from another missionary whom he had visited, a quick-tempered Irishman named McCarthy. The last paragraph hit him between the eyes. He said this, Not as striving to have faith, it read, or to increase our faith, but a look at, at, at the faithful one seems all that we need. And abiding in the loved one entirely for time and for eternity. Hudson Taylor was amazed at his own blindness. I will strive no more, he said. It was all a mistake to try to get the fullness out of Christ. He promised to abide with me. I am a part of him. Each one of us is a limb of his body, a branch in the vine. After that day, people noticed a change in Hudson Taylor. He labored, he prayed, he dis disciplined himself harder than ever but not with a sense of strain or agony. He now radiates the magnetism of the love and the happiness. For he no longer was a man who struggled, but a man who was being used. That is a beautiful picture of the abiding life. I'll stop right here. Father, thank you for... Your grace, your grace, your grace. Father, how often my own sin, Lord, I get over that grace. 
Lord, I, we take it for granted, this abiding life. You have called us. What a privilege it is. What a privilege it is to abide in the great I am. We thank you, Lord, for your invitation to us. We thank you that we could come and we could eat and we could drink and we could linger and we could dwell in the Son of God, in the Son of God, and that the Son of God, His life, His breath, His spirit, His ministry, His character, His person. What a privilege to come and to be pressed through our lives and prove to be Christians, Christians of the truest kind. And so as our Father, who is glorious, may His vine, may His branches that He planted be glorious and reflect the glory of His being. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.